here's our fantastic agenda of hopefully all the things that we're going to try and share with you today. We've basically broken out into three sections, and each one of us is going to tackle one of the sections. Um, the first one here is creating a plan, including marketing research and uh, marketing plan basics. The second chunk is finding opportunities, which I know a lot of you talked about networking and, and uh, that kind of good stuff. So we'll get, cover some of that there, as well as RFQs and RFPs. And then the third chunk is promoting your brand. Um, and that's kind of helping get your name out there, public relations, promotions, advertising, social media, I think, is going to be touched on there for those of you that mentioned that. So just to kind of give you an idea of how things are going to flow today. And I am Diana White. Um, I'm, I work here at Donley's. Um, I'm a CPSM, which means I'm certified <laughs> in terms of uh, marketing professional services through the Society for um, SMPS, Society for Marketing Professional Services. So um, there's a great handbook. If you ever want to get more involved or things like that, you can talk to me later. OK, so first, creating a plan. Uh, how many of you have a business plan or a marketing plan already? Show of hands. All right, so we've, we've, got, we've got a few, and a few tentative maybe, kind of, sort of. All right, so a lot of people have plans. They've never put one together before, so they're not necessarily real comfortable with their plans. And for those of you that don't, I know there's a lot of reasons why. A lot of times, you're just too busy out there chasing work. You don't want to sit down at your desk and, and take the time to put it together, especially if you don't know where to start. Um, a lot of people think you're doing just fine without it, although in this kind of economy, this tends to be where you kind of sit and look at your sheets and go, OK, maybe I really need to sit down and make a plan now. Um, and like I said, a lot of people don't know where to start. So the things that a plan can do for you, um, you can work more efficiently. All that time you've spent out there chasing work, you may not have had to be chasing anything if you had a plan to follow. You could have just been doing, 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 rather than chasing and finding. Um, you can identify projects first or opportunities first to bid on, get ahead of your competition, get in the door first, make those networking connections first, as well as create a roadmap for your business so that you can follow it and kind of you know, weather this storm with your company and, and uh, you know, use, use the resources that you have uh, to better promote your company and get that, get that next job. So the first thing we're going to talk about, and the first step in, in putting together a plan, is market research. And market research is really important, and a lot of people just want to skip right over that and get to the next step. But you need to take the time. Uh, at, believe me, it's really worth the investment, because what that research can do is help you gain competitive advantage and make better decisions. The more informed you are about what's going on in the environment around you, the more information you have to work from, and the better choices you're going to be able to make. So all the things that market research can do for you can help you locate possible resources for projects. You can identify the trends before they hit you, and you can plan ahead for those speed bumps that you might find or those opportunities that might be lurking out there, hiding behind a tree somewhere you can't see it. <laughs> um, you can identify prospects and leads. Um, rather than wait for them to come to you, you can go out to them. Uh, find out what your competitors are up to. Again, gain that competitive advantage over the other people in your market or industry. As well as research potential clients and new markets. So, you know, if somebody has recently moved into the area and maybe you, you didn't even realize they were there, so one more person to add to your network. So all kinds of good things can, can come out of doing this research. Most people don't even know where to start, though. It can be a little intimidating. We know that there's a lot of information out there on the, the web now that's free, but it's hard to find that jumping off point. So basic four steps uh, that you can follow in your quest for, to find that market research information. Um, the first one is determine your needs. The second one is to create that plan of attack. And the third one is to get organized, because a lot of people don't think about that. <laughs> it can really end up saving you a lot of time in the end. And then you're ready to start your research, OK? So let's talk about determining your needs. What is it that you want to know? Start there, ask yourself that one simple question. And there's four kind of baskets that you can put those questions into. And there's more than that, but just to start off. Uh, competitor information. Again, who are the people that you're usually up against? Who are you bidding against? Um, finding out more information about them. 
see, you know, use your connections resources to get whatever little bit of information you can about what they're doing, what they're like. Um, client information, a lot of you, that may be GCs, CMs, um, other people, it could be other subcontractors. Whoever those key clients are for your firm, find out what's going on with them. Are they doing really well? Are they having trouble getting jobs themselves? Um, that can kind of help you as we move through this process, knowing, you know, taking their temperature of what's going on with them. Um, market information and forecasts. Um, again, maybe there's a certain market that you prefer to work in, uh, like healthcare, higher education, K through 12. It's good to know what's kind of going on with that industry to see if maybe you need to branch out or just stay where you are. See what's going on for the long term with the construction industry. You know, what's, what's 2012 going to be bringing in the door for us? And then for a lot of you, material pricing is also going to be a big issue. You know, what are the pricing trends? Um, if you're going out there and you're bidding your work uh, and prices are expected to go up by 8% by next year, how is that going to impact your business and do you need to plan ahead for that? Okay, so the next step, you're going to start creating your plan of how you're going to gather your resources and, and where you're going to go to find all this great information. There, like I said, there's a ton of free information out there for you to work from. Uh, company websites, both for your competitors, people that you're targeting business with, for vendors. Um, go and just see what they've got on their website if you've never been there before. Uh, there might be some good news releases out there. You might see what kind of projects they're currently into. Um, again, free easy to go find, you can just Google it. Also publications, you know, the Cranes uh, website, it's a good source for just kind of generally what's going on here in Cleveland. Um, I believe they also have uh, sites for Columbus and some of the other cities that Cranes covers. Um, regional Midwest Construction uh, and National e &R has a great website. Uh, they just listed uh, the top 400 contractors uh, for 2011, just came out this week. So if you haven't checked that out, maybe you want to, that be, you know, kind of a neat source of information to see who's in maybe the markets that you cover, you know, how people are doing up, down, all that kind of good information. Uh, and then, of course, people you know. Networking is one of the best ways in this industry to get an idea of what's going on and what's coming up. So, you know, go to your clients, the professional and trade organizations like CEA. Um, and then teaming partners, if there are part, you know, other firms that you team with a lot, or you know, maybe you're a contractor, check with architects. You, know, you may not necessarily work with them directly a lot, but they can be a good source of information and leads. All right, so now you've kind of decided what you need to know. You have an idea of where you're going to go to find it, but how are you going to present it and how are you going to organize it? Because if you take the time to figure that out before you start throwing data into some sort of spreadsheet or Word document or PowerPoint, and then you find out later down the road, oh, I wish I had done it this way, it'll save you time in having to try to go back and redo it. We're all about saving time. <laughs> so figure out, you know, how do you want to use it? Is this just for you? Are you going to use this to make decisions? Are you going to share it with other people at your company? Um, you know, and, and how are you going to present it if you are? Um, you know, depending on what, what format you want to use, there's different tools. Excel is great for spreadsheets if you want to put all the data in there and then sort it to see, you know, which, what's going to be the biggest thing coming up, what's going to be the fastest growing thing coming up, or maybe you want to be able to put it into a mailing list format and send out mailings later. Maybe you're collecting names and addresses. Excel would, might, might be your best tool. Um, if you want to put together a printed report to pass out to people, you probably want to put it in Word. There's some great tables that you can use in there to organize your data. There's great chart tools because visuals go a long way rather than just words and bullet points. Or if you want to do a fantastic presentation, <laughs> um, PowerPoint is a fantastic tool uh, between you know, the charts that you can do there as well as tables, the, the, the fancy smart art now that we can do in, in PowerPoint. So, Think about, you know, before you, you really go out there and start putting it all together, think about how it is you want to present all of this. Because there's no point in going out and collecting the data if you're not going to keep it and use it. <laughs> so <laughs> figure out what's, what's going to work best for you in terms of using it long term. So now you're ready to start your research. There's some key questions that you need to ask, though, before you go out there. You need to figure out, okay, who's going to be doing it? Is it actually going to be you? 
Are you going to have an admin person help you with it? Are you going to have your partner or prin other principals help you with it? You know, who's going to be working on this? And then figure out who's doing exactly what. What is their task going to be? Because if you just go back to that and say, hey, I've got all this great information. We should do this. Unless you figure it out and, and plan it and set your goals and your deadlines, it's, it's probably just going to sit on that neat information pile there on the side of your desk. So, and again, determine when you want it done by. I know we're all busy. I know if somebody just hands me something, hey, this is something good for, that I think you should work on, it, it's just going to keep put, getting pushed to the side unless you actually said, hey, I want to have this done by the end of June, and, you know, we're going to move forward from there. So, all right, so once you've decided all of these little things, and it may seem like a lot, but really it'll go really quickly once you decide that, yes, this is what I want to do. Um, so you're ready to go out there and do it. And here are some of the great free online resources that you can use, depending on what it is you want to find out. If you want to know what's going on with the construction market, population growth, those kind of key drivers to construction, uh, these economic data links are great for you. Um, AGC, AIA, Read Construction Data uh, have a lot of great construction-related information specifically. If you want to know what's going on with different markets, um, Grub Ellis has some great research reports on some of the the big cities here in the United States and what the office market's doing. Uh, Department of Veteran Affairs, if you're looking you know, in that government work area. Um, as well as go to your industry and construction associations and your market owner specific associations sometimes have great information. And then also your state offices for some of those type of government related things at the state level. You can find out what, what, their, <coughs> what their budgets are going to be for next year, work coming up, things like that. So once you've done your research, you've got it all organized, you need to talk to somebody about it, even if it's just yourself. <laughs> talk yourself through what you've got there. Um, the best thing is, you know, keep track of where you find it. Use footnotes, put a little source, you know, at the bottom, um, so that hopefully you're going to be doing this at least every year, so that as you, you update your business plan and things change, you'll know where you found this great piece of information and you know, go back and get the most up-to-date information next year. Because from a year from now, you're not going to remember, oh, I have this great chart. Where did I find that? You're not going to remember. So make sure you write it down. Put that source in there. It'll make it easier uh, to keep doing this going forward. And also, um, you know, if you're trying to present this to other people at your company and they think you know, it's just from you, all right. But you can add a little credibility to it if you say, well, this came from AGC. You know? They know what they're talking about. So. All right, and then you also want to be able to explain it. Now, most of the time, if you've done it yourself, you kind of know what it means and all that kind of stuff, but other people aren't. They don't have that, that genesis from start to beginning of having looked at all this information. So you need to be able to kind of explain it to them, bring them into the loop, um, and use a lot of visual graphics, charts, graphs, that really can, a picture's worth a thousand words is so true, especially when it comes to things like this. You say, well, the market's growing, okay, if you see a chart and it goes boom, 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 that's going to be much more impactful. And also be prepared that people might not like what you found out. <laughs> if you go back and you have an owner that says, we need to stay in K through 12, come heck or high water, but you show them the K through 12 markets going like this, you know, they, they are not going to like that necessarily. So you've got to be prepared for that. Be prepared with your argument of, of where you found all your information and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, just be, be able to stand behind it and say, you know, I'm just telling you what, what's out there and this is what people are saying and this is what, you know, this is fact. Can't argue with fact. All right, so not only can you use all this fantastic information in the marketing plan, which is what I'm going to be talking about next, but there's other sources, once you have it, that you can use from time to time throughout the year. Um, you know, corporate strategic planning, if your company is looking at doing that, you want to grow your business, you think it's time to put in place that, that long-term five-year growth plan, uh, you'll have all the information there to start from. Um, maybe you're thinking about changing up your product or service offerings, and you've already done you know, your planning for the year, but you need to go back and make adjustments. So we'll have all that information available to you. Go no-go decisions. If you're on the fence about whether you should be chasing something or not, you can take a look at what your competitors are doing and find out, well, you know, where you think they're going to be coming in at. Are they also going to be going after it? How you need to adjust your pricing for that? 
um, partnering with other firms, customer service, which I mean that's that that can make all the difference sometimes in an economy like this too, how you how you serve your customers. So and a lot of other things. So research isn't just a, a one shot trick pony. <laughs> you can use it throughout uh, the year in many different ways. All right, so let's talk about marketing plans. So for those of you who have never really taken the time to think about, well, what is a marketing plan, what goes into a marketing plan, or you just didn't know what all should be included in that, this is a basic definition. And the key word there to take away, I think, is map. Because you're going to chart how you're going to go from here to there. And you kind of know where you are now especially after you've done your research, you have a better feel for the market and what's going on. But you really need to determine where it is you're going. You need to set some strategic direction for your firm. And then what you're going to do to get there. And that's really what kind of what a marketing plan can do for you. Um, you know, it's those shared strategies and tactics to ensure successful direction. So that's really what you're going to be putting together. So you can make a marketing plan as complex and detailed as you want. Or you can keep it pretty simple and basic. The key thing is, whatever you're going to put together, make sure you're going to use it. So sometimes if, you, if it's 25 pages long, that's just too much. It's too much detail. It's not realistic. You know, it's, it's not going to be usable necessarily for your firm. You know? Some people can get away with basically a one-page outline of what they're going to do. Probably a little more than one page. But you know, figure out, you'll, you'll feel out what's right for your firm. But the thing is, you know, as you go through and put it together, just keep it simple, keep it basic the first time around. You can always go back and add to it. So we're going to analyze, we're going to set goals and develop strategies, and we're going to create and implement those marketing programs. So the first piece here is to analyze. And you're going to look at your firm, you're going to look at your competitors, and you're going to look at your key markets. So you've got all this great information already. Now you're, you're going to start breaking it down and really seeing what the meaning is for you. Um, you're going to look at experience and performance record for your firm. What is it that you're good at? You know, what are your weaknesses? How about your competitors? How do they stack up against you? You're going to look at the market trends. Like I said, if you're in like that K through 12 market, you know, what's going on with that market? If that's where you, you've gone back and you've looked to see you know, the projects and the bids that you've been winning, if you see some trends of some markets that you've been really successful at, see you know, how that trend line is going to be for them coming up in the future. Uh, also, maybe you've been working with some of the same GCs, CMs, or other clients. Maybe they, you have one guy that makes up 50% of your business. You probably want to see you know, how they're doing in this economy. Because <laughs> if they're 50% of your business and something happens to them, <coughs> you've got a big hole to plug. So again, also look at your competitors. What are you know? See where they're at. Have they made any strategic changes? Are they branching out? Are they pulling back in? Um, and then also those networking and partnering opportunities. Who can you connect with? Who can you get information from? Who can get you that foot in the door? So you've probably heard of the SWOT analysis. It's a great tool for breaking all of these fantastic things down. Uh, you've got your internal and external analysis. So you're looking within your company, and you're looking at all those things going on outside your company. And you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses, and you're looking at the opportunities and threats. So you know, what are you good at? What aren't you as good at? You know, opportunities, you know, is there something that you heard about? Or when your competitors maybe went out of business? You know, is there some place that you can go that's going to strengthen your business outside? You know, a good direction maybe that you want to extend yourself. And also threats. Maybe one of your competitors has been moving in on one of your key clients. Uh, maybe there's a new firm in town that is expanding regionally. You know, those, are, those are important things that you need to look at in terms of your firm and, and the world around it. Some questions you can sit down and ask when you're doing a SWOT analysis. Just some different ideas. I think the key thing there is you know, a lot of people tend to do this with the owners of the firm the principles of the firm, just you know, that, that management team. I think it's really important, too, if you've got boots on the ground in your organization, pull them in and ask them what's going on out there in the field when they're interacting with some of these other companies, when they're act interacting with your key clients and customers. 
you know, bring them in, ask them these same questions, because you're going to get different answers. So everybody brings a little bit of a different perspective to this. And that's a, that's a good thing. <coughs> so again, just, you know, strengths and weaknesses, product service offerings, locations serve, maybe, you know, Cleveland, you're not doing so well here. You want to look at Columbus or Cincinnati or Pittsburgh, some of those different areas. Um, customer perceptions, I think, is really important. You know, how do your clients perceive you? I think that's a question, you know, we think we know how they perceive us. But, you know, maybe you want to, you know, do a free survey through SurveyMonkey and send it out to your, your, your top 10 people that you work with most often and, and really get some feedback uh, to see, you know, anonymously what it is they really think of your firm. Uh, the main thing, though, when it, all this is said and done, is how are you different? That's going to be your competitive advantage. And that's what you can use in your marketing plan to really get that message out there to help build your business. What is it that sets your firm apart? What do you want to set your firm apart? And now you're going to figure out how you're going to get there. OK, so now we're ready to set some goals and develop some strategies. We've got all this great analysis. We've got all this great information. Now we need to start making some decisions. All right, so there's, there's different kinds of baskets that those can fit in. Um, like in terms of services, you know, the type and mix that you offer. Uh, maybe you want to expand, maybe you want to change it up a little bit. Um, so again, you need to pick that starting point. So where are you now? All right, where are the market opportunities and threats? Where do you want to be? Does that make sense for your strengths and weaknesses? And do you have the resources you need to accomplish that? These are all really important questions you need to ask yourself. Because you can say, hey, I want to be all the way over here. But do you have what you need to get there? Again, you can look at locations. Where and who? You know, are you just serving the Cleveland market now? Are you serving Northeast Ohio, which includes you know, Akron, Canton, and some of those other? Do you want to expand that regionally? Do you want to go down to Florida? You know, what are the things that you're thinking about doing? Where is that growth going to be for what you provide? And is it travelable? Um, you know, where are your competitors? You know, what markets are they in? You've maybe looked at that and you see, oh, this guy's here. He's also in Kentucky. This guy's here. He's also in Pennsylvania. You know, where, what direction do you want to grow your firm? And again, determine if you, if you can do that. Do you have the resources you need or do you do need to add resources? And some people just want to pick a number. They want to grow their business. And that's, that's fine again. Look at where you are now. How much do you want to grow? And again, what makes sense? <coughs> But no matter what you do, make sure it's something you can actually achieve. You know, be realistic. We'd all love to double or triple our business in a single year. Most of us can't do that. <laughs> so really think about it, you know, where you want to go and if, if you can really achieve that. So once you've kind of gone through that thinking process, you can, you can pick out these goals. You want to make sure they're specific and measurable. You don't want to just say, I want to grow my business and make more money. I want to grow by $1 million, and I'm going to be able to track that through my work in place. And that's, and most importantly, I can do that for my company. That makes sense for me. All right? Now, once you've, you've done that, then you need to assign responsibility <laughs> and ensure that the person has the resources to accomplish it. You can go and turn to your foreman and say, you're going to be doing X much more work but if you don't give them the ability to hire more people, if you're already maxed out, there's no way that that can happen. So you're going to create a barrier for yourself that way. So you want to make sure that whatever it is, you know who's doing it, and they have what they need to succeed at doing it. All right. So again, also don't set it and forget it. <laughs> it's one of those things that, OK, we've done all this. Whew, glad that's over. It's going to sit there for a year. Because then it doesn't do you any good either. So you want to make sure you don't just leave it and forget about it. Revisit it. OK, so now you've got your goals. You know you're at point A, and you, you know you want to go to point B. And we're just as an example, we're going to say we're ex going to expand our service to include widget making in Cleveland with a goal of $1 million per year in revenue. It's specific, and it's measurable. OK, good. So now how are we going to get there? And that's, that's the rest of this that we're going to be doing now. So there's different tools that you can use to get from point A to point B. And 
Jeff's going to be talking about some of them with business development and networking, as well as you know your proposals and, and how you're going to pursue some of those jobs. And then, of course, there's you know direct marketing, promotional campaigns, advertising, PR, which are all the wonderful things Nancy's going to be talking about to you today later. So there's this great little toolbox and mix of things you can pick from uh, to help you get. That's going to be your map. So just as some examples, when we talk about business and networking, uh, use your existing contacts, join those industry associations, uh, you know, maybe exhibiting at trade shows that, that make sense for your firm. Uh, if there's lead services that you think might be useful for you, buy into those. Uh, you know, make sales calls, all that kind of good stuff there. Some other tactics, you know, advertising. Mailing campaigns, maybe you won't need to make a new brochure if that makes sense. Monthly email programs. As well as, you know, get, get a story published on your firm if you can. You know, maybe make those relationships, you know, put it in builders exchange or properties. You know, send press releases out. Uh, you know, speak at some place to establish yourself as an industry expert. So all of these, you know, kind of ideas, they're going to get more in-depth than that. But just to give you an example of what some of those items could be. All right. You can have a hundred great ideas. The question is how much are they going to cost? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of you are nodding your heads. Yes. Um, you know, it's great to come up with these, all, the, all these great ideas. You need to set a budget, though. In addition to being actionable and measurable goals and, and this great roadmap of how you're going to get there, again, you've got to bring yourself back to reality and see, OK, what, how much do I really have to spend on this? And does that make sense for my company? Uh, you want to work from the bottom up you know, as you plan it all out, cost it all out. And that's going to be your most accurate way. You don't want to just you know, eyeball it. Ah, I'm going to do a newsletter. And it's going to cost me ah, you know, 100 bucks. Well, <laughs> it depends on your quantities and, and are you going to have it printed in-house? Are you going to go out to a digital printer? Go ahead and get a quote if you can. That way, it'll bring you into reality. You'll know what you're really working with there and see if it's really a reasonable idea for your firm. So if you find out at the end that you, know, you want to spend about $1,000, all these great ideas are going to cost you about $5,000, you probably need to go back and start over. And again, this whole assigning who, what, and when. You know, it, it makes people responsible. If you have somebody responsible and they know when they need to get it done by, it's more likely to actually happen. So when you're out there chasing work, sometimes this marketing stuff kind of falls to the side. But it's important, and if you really want to get it done, you know, assign responsibilities and create a calendar of when this stuff's supposed to be done by. That will really kind of help keep you organized and, and keep the process moving along. And then you want to track it. Make sure you're measuring your results. You know, maybe you did a mailing, you did an ad, you went to a trade show. You know, what did you actually get out of that? You know, don't just do it and then go and move on to the next thing. What, how did that work for you? You know, did you get a lot of phone calls? Maybe you ended up getting a job out of it. You know, that's great. Then you're getting results. Now, if you didn't get anything out of it, figure out what it cost you to do that and see was it worthwhile. Um, did your cost equal your return? So if you spent $1,000 on an ad and you didn't hear anything from anybody about it, then, and you have another one that you're scheduled to do later in the year, you may want to cancel that and go back and put that money where you can really make it work for you. So, and again, revisit the plan as often as you need to. Some people only do it once a year, and again, I think that does a disservice to themselves. You need to revisit it at least quarterly. And you probably want to just check in with it monthly and see where you're at, see if you're on track, if you're getting the results that you want to be getting. Uh, just kind of a, a general definition of marketing versus sales. I think uh, um, Diana did a, a terrific job in taking you guys through marketing research and uh, in the marketing plan. But the, marketing is everything that, that supports the sale up until the point where you're actually in front of a customer and proposing on a project. Um, if you look at things, and I'll, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail through the whole sales process from a suspect, which we call, you know, just at the very earliest stage of the, the process up and through the close of the sale, whether it's a win or loss. Um, 
probably around the uh, prospect needs analysis is when sales gets, gets involved. But um, up until the point when you're proposing on a project, um, that's, uh, that's marketing. And closing the deal applies to sales. Um, unless you lose a sale, in which case it's estimating fault. Uh, <laughs> setting your goals, uh, this is very basic. Uh, you take your, your target, where do you want to be in terms of total sales? I want to, uh, you know, I want to be, I want to have $50 million in sales for the year. Okay, so you take that figure and you take from that what you have, your whip, your, your work in progress, your, your, your backlog, you know, plus what you would have, the sales, sales from current customers, but I kind of would replace that with projects that you've won but are just in pre-construction. So in our case, as a CM, we might have a pre-con contract with somebody, but for whatever reason, if we screw something up, uh, it's, it's a separate contract between pre-construction and construction. So it's not like 100% that we're going to do the job in construction and actually make some money, um, but it's, it's pretty close. So you subtract that figure, and that's where you get to your additional sales required. Now let's say you want 50 million, and you got 10 million, so that gives you $40 million in additional sales that are required. And, but $40 million is, is not the figure that you really want to focus in on. Because that's, okay, that's what you, you have to get to. But you're going to have to sell, or you're going have to have to have a lot more in your pipeline to be able to sell that $40 million. Now, as a general rule of thumb for us, um, we're kind of, for a CM project, we're kind of at a, maybe 25%. That's just how we plan. It's not always that it works out that way. But that we will, we will successfully win a project. If we get, uh, uh, you know, $80 million worth of work, we'll get, you know, 10% of that. So, uh, or 25% of that. So that's kind of a figure we use for CM work. For concrete, it's 33%, um, just because there's less competition and that's a particular expertise of, of ours. So. So yeah, for that figure, that's, that's a good, that's where you want to get to as far as your total, that's your, your final objective, but you're going to have to have a lot more in your pipeline to be able to, to get to that point. Uh, prioritizing your prospects, uh, two common ways to do it is, is volume and compatibility. Um, give you some examples, I mean, uh, Cleveland Clinic is, is our, our best customer, um, and, and they do a lot of work. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline, you know, stuff that they're doing. Um, and compatibility, you know, we do a lot of healthcare work, so that, that works out well. But it's a combination of, of those two factors. I mean, you can have a, a, a client that you've worked with tons of times, you, you've got a great relationship with them, they, they love the work that you do, and, uh, and they love your team. But if they don't have stuff coming up, then, then that doesn't factor into it. The other piece of it is, okay, you know, a big school out east has got uh, $500 million worth of CM work coming up. We've never done work for them. Uh, we don't do a lot of agency CM work, so they're not really high on our priority list. So it's, it's, it's a mix of, of those two factors. Okay. What is everybody's, uh, just out of, some, somebody volunteer what, what they consider to be a lead. This is kind of the, the CSI thing. It's an indication or a clue. And, and on my next slide, I'll kind of get into what the differences are in between the, the different types of leads. But the best, well, I'll just wait for it. But it's in its very basic term, it's an indication or a clue of something. Um, these are sources of, of leads in, in the construction industry. Um, a lot of them that we use, commercial lead services, you know, Dodge um, does it an okay job for us on private leads, finding out about private jobs and finding where things are at. Um, Onvia, is, is anybody familiar with Onvia? Okay, um, that's, that's a pretty good commercial service, but it's, what it's doing is it's scanning all across the, the country and finding, going through newspapers and finding public jobs, publicly advertised jobs. Um, and Dodge does that also, but Onvia just, um, kind of focuses in on that. Um, legal ads, we all know what those are. They're in the Sunday paper uh, throughout, you know, advertising bid opportunities. Fed biz ops for the folks who do federal work. 
Um, it's a good resource. It can be kind of cumbersome, the, the search engine, to utilize that. Um, if you pursue state projects through Ohio, um, now it's the state, uh, the SAO, SAO office um, um, has its website. But, um, you know, all, all these things, there's, they have advantages to them. Um, they're easily accessible. They're not that expensive. Um, but the data is not necessarily all that great or dependable for, for some of these, especially for a, a Dodge. And also the fact that, you know, if these are so widespread and publicly available, everybody knows about them. So your, your best source of leads really is, is the networking process. It's the number one source for lead generation. And when you think of, of leads, it, you know, you can't get focused on, yeah, it's great to find out about a job before somebody else finds out about it. I mean, we all want to know about, you know, a, a new warehouse or a new hospital or whatever it is, you know, before somebody else does. But sometimes a good lead is finding out that, okay, I found out uh, that now in the state of Ohio, where we do a lot of CM at risk, we do a lot of design build, and okay, we got a governor now who's got a lot of problems, but he's very, um, He's a great advocate of alternative delivery systems. So he's going to be a great advocate for getting those things through. So you're finding out about um, market trends is a good example there. And uh, competitor intelligence, uh, finding out what uh, your competitors, okay, your competitors just hired a, a new you know, director of MEP. So you've got to make sure that you've got something to be comparable to that. Um, this is just a source of uh, some uh, network, networking, large, and this is all in addition to personal, obviously your personal network through personal contact, through LinkedIn, uh, all those sources, uh, large construction suppliers. Um, and when I talk large, I'm talking like a Johnson Controls, someone who's got a lot of horses on a national basis, knows what's going on, not just a, you know, a, a place down the street, civic and government groups, um, and also, um, Trade associations are a, a great source, not only of leads, but also of just, just developing relationships. And I mentioned uh, a few of them, COAA, uh, that's when I'm, I'm involved with uh, programs for the Ohio chapter of uh, COA, which is the Construction Owners Association of America. It's a great organization to get involved with. AIA, um, Cleveland, that's important for us because a lot of times our relationships with architects are very important to us as a CM, um, both from a relationship building standpoint um, uh, and also the fact that we get a lot of leads from those folks. APPA, which is the, uh, it's actually the Association, Association of Physical Plan Administrators. These are the top facilities guys on a national basis and they've got regional chapters. And SCUP, which is a society for um, college and university planners. But, Whatever association you join, whether it's these or, or other ones, the key to it is not just to join, but to get involved. And the best way to get involved is to, to get involved, you know, become a chair of these organizations. Because if you're just joining and you're attending meetings, you're not really going to develop a relationship with, with owners as much as you would if you're actually um, getting involved on a, on, a, on a board level. Tips for uh, successful networking when you're in your network, uh, number one, Thing, and this is, this is from the, the design handbook, uh, uh, Diana mentioned it earlier, but the design handbook for the uh, uh, construction uh, uh, industry, design and construction industry, is stay in touch. That's, that's rule number one in, in your network is whoever you're, you're associating with, it's make sure you stay in touch with those people on a, on a regular basis. And also remember the fact that it's not just about you know, finding out about things, it's about sharing information. Because if you're not and it's not a quid pro quo that you tell me something, I'll tell you something, but um, that, that there's knowledge being transferred both ways because sooner or later you're going to find somebody you're giving all this information to and you're not getting anything back and, and that person doesn't belong in your network and you shouldn't be belong in that person's network if, uh, if the reverse is happening. Um, some basics on a, a cold call. First of all, if I can back up a little bit, Everybody seems to be, a lot of people are terrified of, of cold calls. And I don't like them particularly, but I think they're actually, if you're, they're more important than a, let me, 
back up a little bit, the difference between a cold call and not a hot call, but a warm call. A cold call means uh, you don't have any relationship you know, whatsoever with, with this individual. Um, you haven't been referred to by anybody, um, and, it, and you don't know about any particular project coming up. So that, that can make things kind of difficult. But if you're able to get in and, and, and we'll get this to this in the next slide, but if you're able to get in with that individual and, and just uh, have an introductory meeting with that individual, that means a lot because if you're meeting with that individual and it's not about a specific project, you're trying to find out more about them, chances are they're going to appreciate that a lot more than, hey, Mr. X, I want to get into, I, want, I know I've never met you before, but I want to get in and I want to talk to you about Project A. Like, okay, well, I, I wouldn't have seen you otherwise. So if you, you know, the first thing, the key is you want to show interest in them as a company before you show interest in them in a particular project. Otherwise, they're, they're just going to think that you're kind of, kind of predatory. But don't, uh, don't be surprised if, if you don't get the meeting. Um, we talk about the, the gatekeeper, um, whether it's sec secretary, receptionist, someone who feels, uh, or whomever, who feels that it's, it's their job to protect their owner and uh, you know, keep, keep you away from them if you don't have a, an existing relationship with them. Now, the good part is, as opposed to maybe 15, 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, there usually isn't a gatekeeper anymore. Um, people have direct dials, they have direct emails, um, it's a lot, e and they have fewer, quite frankly, administrative staff. So they're operating with less, they're operating more efficiently, so there's less layers that you would have to get through. That's, that's the good news. Um, and in the gatekeeper's defense, I mean, they're trying to protect that, that in individual's time also and make sure that, um, that they're doing their job. Um, just some tips, if, if this person does have some layers and has some gatekeepers, just is kind of... Um, uh, words to keep in mind is call them before 8 o'clock or call them after 5 o'clock. It's just kind of a good rule of thumb. I mean, their facilities guys are early people and they stay late. So, and you know, we're construction people and we come in early and we stay late. Um, so if you call them before or after those times, you'll have a better uh, chance of uh, making some contact. Um, if, if the customer really doesn't want a meeting, um, this is kind of the, the gut check reality check time is if you've tried again and again and again and you've made contact with, with this, this individual and they're still not seeing is you have to know at some point you just got to cut it off. Um, unless you can have somebody who's a, a friend refer you, you know, then uh, you, you got to know when to, to cut it off. But uh, if, if, you, if it isn't, if you're saying two or three months, go ahead and schedule it. But in the interim, so you keep some top of mind, keep that direct mail coming, and uh, keep that establishment. Okay, you make some, some contact, actually. Uh, just some more uh, cold contact, cold call contact uh, things to keep in mind is always keep, if you, you make contact with that person, is even if this person is just would, would talk your ear off for, for half an hour, is, is try and keep focused. Um, because generally, if this is a first time that you've made contact, um, they just maybe they just want to talk, and you can let them talk, but try and keep that 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 initial call to five minutes or less, because you don't want to have a meeting over the phone. That's number one. You do not want to have a meeting over the phone. What you want to use that that five minutes for is to find out a little bit more about the project, if there is a project, or find out about the the individual, the company, um, and then schedule a personal meeting, and you'll have more success in a personal meeting. Statistics here, persistence wins. Um, this is kind of shocking how many people give up on the first call. 25 do two calls, 12% make three calls. 88% um, yeah, of all sales are, are made after the fifth call. So it's, it does take persistence. And uh, you know, I talk with our, my president, and he, he'll, I mean, he will not return a call sometimes until he gets five calls. But keeping that in mind, again, is you don't want to keep calling. At some point, you need to know when to call it quits. All right, so you got your lead. Let's take them through the, the process of, of getting to the sale at this point. And this is, 
these are, are uh, definitions that, that Donnelly's has, has established for, um, for lead development. Um, they're not universal, but I, I think they work well. Suspect just means that this person uh, has a potential to have a construction project in a certain amount of time. Um, number two, a prospect means you found out that they have a, a project coming up. You don't have a lot of information about it, but you know that they have it coming up within a certain date time frame. Needs analysis means, okay, boom, I've, I've got my, um, had my meeting with this individual, and I'm finding out about the project. I'm finding out who the architect is, who the engineer is, um, you know, whether uh, they prefer CM at risk, agency CM, design build, all these kinds of things. Okay, so you're finding out about the project, and at some point you're just waiting for that RFP to come in that you can respond to. Um, and then you propose on the bid, and then um, you either win it or you lose it, based on estimate. So you got, you got this information, um, you know, what do I get, how, how do I keep track of this? Um, there are a lot of off the shelf, these are some good things. This, these are actually from the uh, Design and Construction Handbook. And these are, and I'll send out a PDF to everybody um, so you have this. I'm sorry I didn't make copies of this thing. But um, these are essential questions to ask when you're looking for some system to keep track of your leads. Um, one thing to keep in mind um, when you're, you're establishing a, a lead um, tracking system is that, you know, ACT is one that's out there. But, um, you know, it shouldn't be something where you're just keeping track of your appointments, your contacts, you know, okay, I did this with this guy today. What you want to do is you, you need to be more holistic than that. You need to think of, it needs to be kind of built around the company, okay, whether it's, it's university hospital. That should be your, your, we call it the parent, okay. And then you have, coming down from that, you have your contacts and you have your projects. And the reason you don't want to ever have a, your lead based on a, you know, a contact is because people lose their job, change jobs all the time. So that would be my a number one thing to tell you um, uh, to do is, is make sure it's based on the company. Just, just some quick things you know, to keep in mind. Can it be customized? Even if it's some off-the-shelf type system, can I customize it at all? Um, you know, obviously, what does it cost? Can I afford to do that? Um, and this is a big thing with our IT guys. Okay, I got this new system, you know, and I've got thousands and thousands of contacts and projects in my database right now. Is can I get that information easily transferred easily from from that system over into my new system? I'll do this real quick. This is just probably because I didn't make this larger. This is a system we use. It's it's called Marketware. It's a computer or a customized solution. Um, uh, it was customized for us, but, but this is kind of the arrangement of it. You have your company, which is your major record, and then you have your project, which is the child, and then contacts is another tab. And we take them through, you know, the status of the sales cycle, you know, what the external source was. Okay, I got this from, um, you know, perimeter architects, you know, internal source, who's actually inputting the data. So if something's screwed up or you got a question about it, you know, wh you know who put that data in? Um, this is always important. You know, the probability of this project even going forward, you know, let's put that down, and then also put down what the prob probability is of, of you actually winning, of you winning the project. This is Pareto's rule. You know, I've talked all this time about leads and, and I don't want to forget the importance, probably the primary importance of, of client maintenance. Um, you know, 80% of your business is coming from your existing, you know, 20% of your, your clients. So it is never to forget and, and always to, to work on your relationship with, with your existing clients. There's, I, I can't emphasize that enough, how important that is. Because, you know, we've always uh, gotten these figures on, on how easy, it, how hard it is to reestablish a relationship with a your existing customer once you've lost it as opposed to, to getting somebody new. Um, but, but also it's important to understand you know, why things are happening uh, as it is to know, you know when they're happening. Essential elements here for client maintenance. Um, you know, it's, it's about serving the client. It's not just finding out about new projects. It's making sure 
but you want to work your way up to with an existing client, even if, if you've uh, worked for this client for, for some time, is, is you want to be looked at as, as much more than just a vendor. You want to be looked at truly as, as an industry partner with them. And that they're a resource um, that would call you and say, hey, um, you know, I'm thinking about three, four years from now, and it's okay if it's way in the future, I'm, I'm going to build, we, we build a lot of parking garages. And hey, we're going to be building a parking garage in uh, three years. Hey, I could really use your guys' help on a parking study and some preliminary pricing on it. And, and you know, we provide that service at no charge because we want to keep that relationship going with the, with the client. Um, because it doesn't matter how many, time, how many years you've had a relationship, how many years that you've been doing business with this, this client, um, it's more, more important that, that they've developed a sense of trust with you and that you are an industry partner with them. RFQs and RFPs, right? You've got, we've done the business development, and, and I'm going to try and orient this. And this is going to be kind of the challenging part because we've got contractors in the audience and we've got subcontractors and suppliers. So I'm going to I'm going to try and address both of them, but I'll answer questions afterwards. But um, these are some essential questions that that you want to ask um, whenever you're putting together an RFQ or RFP. Um, Probably a, a, a number one is, is you know, why are, should we be responding to this RFQ, RFP? And I'll get, get into this. I know Diana mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, the whole concept of, um, you know, a go, no go decision. And even if it's a go, what am I going to do to make my submission um, special? The a number one is institute a formal go, no, no go policy. Now, some of the things I think that you, you know, we talked about it earlier is, is do we have a relationship with this, this client? And, and there's all sorts of resources um, actually through SMPS and, and they've got samples of go, no go sheets, worksheets that you can bring into your, um, to your group, your administer, you know, your, your management group and, and, and you can customize them a little bit, but it'll help you qualify basically whether you should be going after this or not. But I mean, those are some of the basics is uh, you know, making sure that this is a project that you really have a, a good chance of, of not only winning, but making some money at. That's the other thing also. Is it, there can be a you know, great relationship with a customer, but if you're, you know, the fees are uh, not what they, they should be, then you're not going to, to make some money. Oh, number three, I just want to point that out. This is really important. Is, are necessary personnel resources available to produce quality work? And not only to do the uh, the proposal part. I mean, this is kind of focused on the proposal. Okay, I've got uh, my project manager and superintendent, and, and he's available to work on this proposal. And I've got the estimator who's going to put together the you know the bid. It's not just that. It's making sure that, um, especially for uh, especially as project like a, a healthcare project, renovation, expansion type project is okay. You know, I've, I've got the personnel ready to put this proposal together. Is my superintendent who would be ideal for this project? Is he really going to be ready for this? Because you, know, you, you never want to, you never want to submit on a proposal where you know 100% positive ahead of time that that individual is still going to be working, um, because that's that's going to bite you in the butt and it's going to reduce your credibility. It, you know, keeping in mind that you might be bidding this superintendent on six, seven different projects, but if you haven't gotten it, that's fine. But if you know this individual is going to be um, the superintendent, especially because he's going to be there 100 percent of the time on site, make sure that he's he's available. If you don't have a huge staff, um, is to main, maintain some type of database of material that that you're going to use again and again and again for for proposals. And these are some of the standard ones: experience lists, you know, projects that you've worked on before, reference letters, uh, photography resumes. Um, proposal statistics, client satisfaction graphics, is to get these, and it doesn't matter whether you have these in Word or, or InDesign or, or anything, but to get them in a, in a good, organized, and, and it's something that we struggle with all the time, but um, to try as best you can to have a good selection of, of graphics, photos, um, and narrative boilerplate that you're going to use again and again, and keep it updated. 
and we all get these questions in our RFPs, RFQs all the time that we've never had before, and we have to do a lot of digging and work with PM or, or, find, or our accounting guys to come up with the answer, and we've developed this great answer. If you're responding to something that you've done for the first time, never happened before, just make sure that you get that into the proposal boilerplate. Um, and also one, one thing that we, I think, do a good job of do, doing is, is tracking things like sustainability, our lead projects, is keeping an ongoing list of projects that you're doing that are, um, that are lead certified and, and lead accredited uh, professionals. Picking the team, and this is, this is very important. And this, this is kind of, kind of referring strictly to, uh, to your internal team, your PM, your, your superintendent, who's going to be your lead estimator. But it could also uh, deal with uh, who your MBE partner is going to be, um, who your, uh, if it's a design build, who your architect and engineer are going to be. Um, but they, they should have similar experience, um, especially in design build. They better have done, if, and you're picking an architect or engineer, uh, you want to have somebody that you've worked, if you haven't worked with before, you, they better have done design build before or else you're going to have a rocky relationship because the relationship in a design build project is, is much closer um, uh, and there's more of a linkage between the contractor and the A&E &E than in a CM um, relationship. Um, proposal planning, first thing you want to do when you're putting together your proposal is, is get your, your marketing people together um, along with the entire project team, you want to make sure that uh, uh, your operations lead, your, your PM, a lot of our RFPs, we have to put together a schedule. Um, you got to have your, your estimating lead there because even if you're not putting, they're not asking for an estimate, they're asking for fees and general conditions. You know, all the professionals, you want to get them together um, at, at the start because you don't want to be at the end of the show and marketing has got all their stuff together and we still don't have a schedule from the, from the PM. And that's usually one of the things that kind of lags behind. So you want to bring those guys to the front as quickly as possible because they've got, you know, quite frankly, we're doing marketing 100% of the time. Your project manager and the superintendent, they got their boots on the ground. So this is not priority one for them. So you got to bring them up um, as, as soon as you can. Three kind of big boilerplates with, uh, is, is establishing your competitive advantage, owner-centered center content. And, and this can be challenging because you know, one of the other rules with uh, putting together the RFP is making sure that you're answering the questions in the RFP exactly in the order, if, if possible. That's the other uh, key to it, is, is answering the questions in the order that, uh, that's being asked in the RFP. Because nothing will frustrate an owner more than, than not having that happen and having to search for answers. But if you're doing that and you're, you're being responsive to what they're asking, how are you also making sure that the points that you want to get across are getting across? And the way to do that, and it, it might seem kind of, um, kind of natural, but then you find yourself pulling back is, is okay, this, let's say it's a hospital project, hospital renovation project. I want to make sure in my resumes, I want to make sure in my executive summary, I want to make sure in my cover letter, throughout the proposal, I'm emphasizing how much my renovation experience that my team has. So the key there is you can be responsive and do things in the order that's in the RP, but make sure you're, and you see, wow, I'm beating a dead horse. Beat that dead horse. You gotta restate that over and over and over again because you want them to, for that one thought, if it's one thought that, you, that you're the king of hospital renovations and you know, you know what, the, what they're looking for and what's important to them, you want that to be crystal clear so they just, don't be afraid to pound them over the head. Um, there's kind of the essential um, boilerplate. Again, I said follow the RFQ, RFP uh, format. Um, last thing with, yeah, don't be afraid of, of white text at all. I mean, I'm not a design professional. We got great design professionals in there, but uh, don't be afraid of that. And it makes it much easier to read if, if you got lots of white space. So don't be afraid of that. Um, but also, um, do not proof your own work. I, I have a, a uh, well, I've got, a lot of, uh, I've got th three marvelous marketing coordinators, um, but when I have them, you know, work on a cover letter or, or proof even uh, something as, as a large narrative, um, oftentimes I'll have them give it to somebody else to proof also. 
Um, but in my own stuff, I never proof my own work. If it's a marketing coordinator who's, who's written a narrative, I, I never have them proof their own work because you're, you're going to go right past it because your, your natural instinct is, well, I know this. I, I wrote it. You know, I'm familiar with it. Is, is you're going to you're going to gloss over those those tiny mistakes. One thing, just on resumes, is, is make sure the unless they they ask you to do, go more than one page, is keep those to one page. Keep your resume to one page. Um, it's my pet peeve with architects on design build projects is they'll go five six pages on all the awards that they've been submitted for. And we, we want to keep away from that um, and, and just focus in on similar project experience or is, is number one. Um, photographs, that's, that's really uh, a tricky subject. Should you include photographs on your resumes? Um, I would say if you think it could help you, yes. But it's, it's, a, it's kind of a double-edged sword because let's say you got, you got a, you know, a, a list of, you know, uh, and it kind of depends on the project too. If you're going after, let's say, uh, uh, design work on, let's pick a project we're working on now, MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, and you customarily will put photographs of your individuals on that uh, that resume, and you know all your staff are 60-year-old, you know, white-haired gentlemen, then that's probably not going to do what you you want it to do if you want to come across as a, a cutting-edge firm. So. Um, <coughs> I guess my, my recommendation, if you're going to, if you're going to choose between doing, do I do it or do I not do it on a regular basis, I would say don't do it. Um, I wouldn't put the photographs in there unless it's a special circumstance where you, you really think it could help. Um, the last thing with the debrief, whether you win or lose, and, and this is, this seems to be a tough thing with, with, with a lot of people. I, I know I struggle with it, you know. If I lose a project, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I'm struggling to find out, you know, you know why. But I, I always want to find out why. So, um, but then if you win a project, you're like, well, I, you know, I, I won the project. What, what am I going to learn from this? I'm, you know, um, but it, if you win a project, it shows interest um, through your your new client, and it also shows it's your um, not only what it shows, but you're going to find out some things by winning a project. What you did right. And what your competitors did wrong, um, and, and what you, you're trying to pull from it, win or lose, is also um, you want to find out what what whether you're successful in differentiating yourself from your your competition in those types of things. I will tell you this in a debrief, um, and this is just my experience. I learn a lot more actually from a public. Entities debrief, and I do from a private entities debrief, and and I th I think the reason for that is in, in a private debrief, you know, number one is is it's not inherent on them to reveal anything to you, and, and number two, they might just want to protect your your feelings, or or they're just going to give you a pat on the back. In a public forum, and I actually I, I found out the most in a, in a uh, in the SAO's office down in Columbus on a, on a submission we did than I have in any other debrief. In a public debrief, um, you're going to get a, I, may, sometimes a painful item by item debrief of your proposal and your presentation, what worked, what didn't. We're going to be talking about promoting your brand, a little bit about advertising and public relations. Um, giving you the 50,000 foot viewpoint of this, I tend to talk very fast. I know your time is very precious to you. Try to go over everything and meet your expectations and we'll have time for questions hopefully. Um, usually when you go to a lecture or a seminar you wonder who's talking to you. So very quickly I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. Like many of you I have my own company which I started in 2004, NMV Strategies. I call it New Market Value helping companies build their brand, their promotions, their public relations, and also I do a lot of crisis communications training in terms of if you have 2020 knocking on your door or 60 minutes something's happened in your, in your facility or with your people, how do you talk to the media? So I do quite a bit of training, but hopefully that will never happen. But if you're interested, we'll, we can talk about that later. Prior to starting my own business, I was chief marketing officer at Proforma, which is here in Cleveland, Ohio. 
and did a lot in branding and awareness. They were a franchise organization, still are. When I met up with them, they had 200 franchise organizations. After we did a whole public relations branding campaign, they grew to be about 1,000 offices. So it was a really fun, great success story to be with them. <coughs> uh, prior to that, I was director of marketing communications PR at Avery Dennison. You know, the office products people, they also make pressure sensitive. And that's where I really cut my teeth on crisis communications. We had plant explosions, espionage, you name it, I lived it. I was there in the front lines in front of the camera and working with all the great people to protect our brand, plus to handle the, the crisis situation. I was also a, dr a director of advertising and PR for Management Recruiters International, another franchise organization. Can you see a trend here? And uh, worked with them. They were known as headhunters, really turned their brand around to be contingency search placing people, helping people. Long time ago, contingency search was very, very key. Now with the internet, most people are finding jobs, finding positions through the internet. But they're still around, and they're an international firm. Going way back in my career, uh, knowing about public relations, I was director of advertising for an agency here in Cleveland, Sharp Advertising, and did a lot of media contact work. What you're interested in, too, getting your business known through the media, with articles, journalists, doing news releases, things of that nature. So that gives you a little bit of background about my area. What I'm going to be talking about today is an overview of advertising. I heard some of you say you want to know a little bit more about social media. We'll talk about that. Public relations, promotion, and budgeting. Um, both Jeff and De Deanna did a wonderful job talking about the whole view of marketing. And keep in mind that it's product, place, price, and promotion. And to these points, it also interacts with what we're going to talk about with public relations, the things that are happening on social media, how to get your name out there, your brand. What do you do differently? How to get that into the media, how to do a news release. So we'll be, we'll be going over that quite a bit. Um, when you're thinking about public relations, everybody says, what's the PR spin? Well, it's about perception. And there's actually four stages. You have to define, what do you stand for? What's your unique selling proposition? How are you a little bit different than everybody else? When I started my business, there's a variety of marketing people out there in terms of doing the same thing that I was doing. But I tried to figure out, how can I be just a little bit different? How can I talk about my talents? How can I help businesses? So one of the things that I did in terms of crisis communications, which is a, a key part of my business, is I called on Case Western Reserve University, and I asked them, did they have a seminar on crisis communications? To my delight, they didn't went through a lot of background checks in terms of me being an affiliate professor there, but it's made a difference. And I'm sure in every one of your businesses, you do something a little bit different. What do you do? How would you differentiate yourself if you just had to answer that question right now? I do the video delivery. Exactly. That makes you different than probably a lot of the other people in here. So that's what you have to think about. Again, the other points are believe you can do it. Go through your plan, as Diana said. Work your plan. Have it be a living, breathing plan that you can relate to. Just don't put it up on the shelf. A lot of the clients that I work with, they talk about doing PR plans when we put together this beautiful binder, and then it collects dust. No, don't do that. Have a simple plan, maybe an executive summary that you look at every month, every quarter. Go back to it. Make it measurable. Define it. Make it useful. So those are things to keep in mind. Again, believe you can do it. Position yourself. Determine your strategy and achieve to deliver on your promises. And this is all around the measurement status, too. OK, what is advertising? Advertising is different than public <clears throat> relations. Because advertising, you're in control of the message. You're not having a reporter talk about you know, what your business is. You're placing the ad. To some of you, you have to look at your demographics in terms of you're just looking at Northeast Ohio. Are you going to Pittsburgh? Are you going out to other uh, outlying cities to uh, perform your business? So you have to look at, is advertising going to be a solution for you? In our age of all these messages coming at us, we really have to figure out, should you be going to trade publications? Should you be doing advertising in local papers? Again, it's an analysis. It's the competitive analysis, and it's also the research that Diana talked about. There's so many choices. I'll give you a short story. I um, had a client who does performance high-tech trailers, you know, those big trailers that you know, some of the rock stars use and some of the other companies will take their, maybe their products along and they'll have like an open house to walk through the, tra the trailer and 
these things are magnificent. They can cost millions and millions of dollars. So high performance, high tech trailers, they're located in Painesville, Ohio. They wanted to increase their market share. They wanted to get some more customers and their, their key line with me is, you know, we have to do advertising, Nancy. We have to do advertising. We want to grow our business. And I said to them, well, how much do you want to grow by? Oh, you know, they gave me a percentage. And I said, well, what does that really come down to? I said, because we could do, you know, a big national advertising campaign, or we can do a small democratic campaign, or regional, or whatever. What it came down to is that they only wanted four new customers. Because uh, as Jeff talked about, what is your bandwidth? Do you have the personnel, do you have the background support behind you to get all this new business in? If you don't, don't do a lot of advertising. Don't do a lot of PR. Do networking, be focused, look at where you want your news releases to go and go after it, differentiate yourself, but don't override your expectations because then you can't deliver on what you're promising. Okay, advertising examples. You have to think about image, product, price, co-op, direct mail, print, broadcast, and one thing I didn't put down here is websites. Elements of advertising. The elements of advertising are uh, developing you know, what the message point you want to be in terms of controlling the message, getting the information out. Advertising is different than public relations in that you're controlling the message, but you also have to ask yourself as, con as a consumer when we see an advertisement, we, all, we always say to ourselves, is it true or are we suspect about what the message points are? So advertising, you can control it, you can say good things about your company, and it gets the information out there precisely as you want it. So there's a basis to do advertising. And it also motivates people to learn more about your company and to get you more attention. Why advertise? It's fast, it builds credibility, it defines your message in your target market, and you can also have an avatorial from one of your clients to give an overview on the great work that you've done. So here are different elements that you can think about. Social media and websites. Okay, how many of you are involved in LinkedIn? Okay, um, how many people are involved in discussion groups on LinkedIn? I met with a um, um, social media expert about two weeks ago, and he said to me, for my business, and here, you know, I'm our marketing person, I should know this. He said, you know, you should get, you know, five new people a day to link in, to, to be on LinkedIn, you know, to expand your network. And you should also ask for like 10 recommendations a week. And so I said, well, how do you do this? How do you have time to do your business? I mean, we're all very busy. Well, you just have to, I don't know if these are the right numbers for everybody, but it, no, but it, and if you're committed to, just being on there, say, like 10 minutes every Monday morning or, you know, Friday before you're you know, closing up your office to go for the weekend. But just if you have a schedule and you're committed to it. And um, I'm here to tell you by doing the recommendations and expanding on LinkedIn, I just got a call yesterday from someone who I'm meeting with for new business tomorrow. So it's things like that. Social media, uh, many of us who have children, they, we see social media and how it's working, but I'm here to tell you social media is part of business. You need to expand it, you need to go do more on LinkedIn, more on the discussion groups, because then you become a subject matter expert. Subject matter expert, like what is your business? Uh, carpentry. Carpentry. Now what do you do differently than anybody else does? So you do, um, maybe there's not a lot of companies in Northeast Ohio who do that, or maybe you were out on a job that provided a little bit more of a challenge. You could go on LinkedIn and start a discussion group, and this is how we handled it. Has anybody else had this experience? Or how, how could we have done it a little bit differently? Or just you know, put on three different things to think about if you're ever confronted with this type of challenge that we had last week. And that starts a whole discussion group, but then positions you as a subject matter expert. And once that starts creating its own level of activity, um, maybe a couple weeks from now, you'll get a call that says, I need your help on this. And that's how it works. Okay. So these are all the, the different social media websites. 
If anybody wants some more information on how to track these, please just email me. I have a whole list of resources. If you're looking at the blogs, if you're trying to get involved in your area of construction, there's ways that you can monitor it too, and they all come into one point on your email so that at the end of the day, rather than hearing all these pings with emails coming in, they go into one central area and then you can take a look at them. So that's a way also of organizing the time commitment that you have to go with social media. What is public relations? Well, it's not free publicity because it takes work to do it. We're going to talk about developing your press kit and developing your news releases. But it's third party endorsement. What do you trust more, an advertisement or an article that you read in a newspaper about a business or a company or a service? You, you trust the advertisement more? What about if John Funk, who's the Plain Dealer business editor, and he wrote about your business and the wonderful work you do with fire and renovation and everything? Do you think people would think more of the article or more of the advertisement? Yeah, well, they both, they both get the message across. And if the ad, you're right, if the ad is done correctly, that will be solid. But there have been communication studies done and the whole area of public relations and having the third party endorsement from the journalist is very, very powerful. So that's why um, I would have you think about PR a little bit. <laughs> okay, branding. You have to brand yourself. You know, all of you out there are your own unique brand from the companies that you work for. Think about how you differentiate yourself. Image is everything. You know, you have to stand tall, be proud. People want to work with winners and they also want to work with people who are successful. You go into a meeting and somebody asks you about your business and you say, wow, it's been a really hard year, you know, business is down. No, you got to put on the face of proud, confident. Business has been, uh, you know, pretty good. I'm looking for new opportunities and also this is the project that I'm working on and be uh, very excited to work with you. Confidence. People love confidence. Public relations is about confidence. But also, what is your unique selling prop proposition, your USP? Again, all of you out there have a unique selling proposition. Define it, use it through public relations to get the word out about it. Uh, questions for our company. Who are we? How are we perceived? What is our identity collectively and individually? Many of you are small companies. Some of you are very large companies. You know, the, the information, your brand, your personality should go from the top all the way down to everyone who works for you. And so the next kind of like committee meeting or you know, meeting with the, your people, ask them, tell me in 15 seconds, what is my company? What do we stand for? Okay, PR examples. Um, it could be an event, could be a PR mailing, a feature article, networking, endorsements. All these things that will attract positive public relations, either in the trade journals, in Crane's Cleveland Business, Willoughby Papers, Willoughby News Herald, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer. So always when you put your hat on to think about public relations, you know, if you're out at a construction site and you're partnering as a contractor or a subcontractor and it's a new building, think about having a photograph, a, a photograph of you starting that project and putting it on your website, sending it out with a news release. So always think in, in the mindset of can I have an event can I also get my team together and maybe do the upcoming bike-a-thon for the Diabetes Association and then have the team who's on the bike-a-thon put that photograph on your website. It shows that you're involved in the community, plus it gets your name out. What did Bar uh, P.T. Barnum say? You know, the only bad publicity is if you don't, my name's not in it. Okay, so getting your name out, getting your brand out, that's all about PR and you can do it in a variety of ways. Again, the elements of PR is not paid advertising. When a journalist writes an article, you're not paying for them, for them to do that. Um, it's real strict, the rules about working with a, a journalist. Um, I did a lot of work with the Washington Post and, uh, years ago, and I went to D.C. to take the reporter out to lunch, and when the check came, I, I went for the check, and they said, nope, we can't do that, because they have a very strict rule about integrity that I, as a PR person, wouldn't be paying for their lunch as paying for the story. 
Um, so the elements of PR in terms of working with the media are, are very detailed in terms of getting them the information, asking them to uh, provide um, a good article, and also helping them fact check. But not too many of them will give you the article before it's, it's completed. Okay. Why use PR? Well, it creates a buzz, and it also creates a third-party endorsement, and it uh, positions you as being even more credible out in the, in the marketplace. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to put together a news release and how to get more PR out there. And I'd like to uh, do a handout, since we're going to be talking about uh, news releases. Here's 38 reasons why to do a, a press release. I can probably, if I had a little bit more time, come up with about uh, 50 more reasons. But um, the whole idea of putting together a press release, it allows you to give information out, send it to a newspaper reporter or TV or a radio station, and have them call you back and get more information and interview you. Plus, it gets the word out. You can also take a news release and also send it out to your clients or potential clients, getting the word out on who you are and what you do. Okay. Developing a PDR uh, strategy, you have to look at who you want to contact. Media lists, which means the newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, even web publications online. Develop the list, put it together, find out who the reporter you want to attract. It's usually the business reporter, or it can also be the reporter who covers housing, construction, do a little work. Again, it isn't just open up the newspaper and see who's covering what, or even call the newspaper and ask them, you know, who covers this beat. Uh, there's always feature opportunities. Um, a lot of information can be given to a newspaper reporter, and you never know when they're working on a story that could possibly include you. So it's good to have that relationship. When um, I'm, I'm pass this around, this is Novogard Solutions, which is right here in Cleveland. This is an example of a, a press kit that I did for them. Um, there was an article that they had in a trade journal that I included. They have different types of products that go in here, the background around the company. These are all different elements that you can have in your press kit so that it gives the whole story about what your company does, who you are, how you're unique, and gives a whole background information on the reporter who's doing the huge story. Now, from right out of the gate, you don't have to have this huge pre-R kit. You can start out step one with a news release, and we'll talk about how to put together a news release. There's also things that you should uh, consider with your PR plan. How many of you, when you go in to make a cold call or a meeting with a company, do you have a marketing piece that you leave behind? Great. So these are examples of some of the different marketing pieces. Um, in this day and age of people not reading, I would say this is a lot to read, but this was like a case study of the roofing company that I worked for, and then this was a more extensive uh, marketing piece because this part of the business was going to the Department of Transportation. And we know those government people, they like doing a lot of reading. So this was a, a kit that we put together for them. So just several examples for, for you to, to take a look at. Okay, creating a PR plan. This is the Cliff's Notes version, the summary version. I'm not a big fan of PR plans that go into like a three inch binder. Because as I said before, nobody uses them. You have to have like the executive summary, a real good overview of what you want to accomplish, what your objectives and goals are, what strategies you're going to use, and what tactics. So let's see. Pass this out too. I don't know how I'm doing dividing all this up, but we'll try. I'm going to be talking about the power of three because I've done a lot of studies in terms of the communications process and people say, Nancy, you always talk about three. You know, three this, three that. Well, what is it? Uh, ready, aim, fire. Ready, set, go. Um, the, the brain works in threes. Uh, how, we don't have three little lights in the traffic, five little lights in the traffic lights. We have three. We have red, yellow, green. And so they've done a lot of studies, too, that 
finding out that in terms of communication, the rules of, of threes really make sense because that what people can grasp. So I always say to my clients, and I'm saying it to you, that when you talk about what your objectives are for your business and your PR plan, think in threes and then develop beyond that. So this is a great article you can read later about the power of threes and um, it goes along with what you're trying to do. When you're creating a PR plan, talk about an executive summary, a situation analysis, and a goal. You know, three definite areas to be concerned about. And if you go through um, this, which uh, is also on the plan that you have in, in front of you, it'll get you on the mindset of what you need to do for public relations. Again, the power of three. So three objectives are key. And I also uh, want to talk about target audiences. Many of you are going to be um, you know, looking at where you want to expand your business and how to get the message out about your business. So when you, you look at your target audiences, you also have to look at the demographics. You have to look at your competition. You don't want to be everything to all people. You want to be targeted in your approach to what the business you want to do and who you want to go after. Again, it goes back to the research that Diana talked about in terms of you know, what's out there, how the businesses are doing, who's doing what, and what's available to you, and how do you differentiate yourself to get that new business. It's the same thing with public relations and your message points. And keep your messages simple. Again, list no more than three key messages you want to impress upon your target audience. Again, you know, people think, oh, I can't put together a PR plan. Yes, you can. Break it down. Three. Everybody can handle three objectives. And then you, go, you build it from there. This is a handout on strategies for, versus tactics. Um, people tend to get confused in terms of what is strategic and what is tactical. And I found this uh, definition that I thought gets everybody on the same page. If you have a strategy that says, I want to gain market share, well, the one strategy would be to gain market share would be brand building. And as part of a company's brand building strategy, they might adopt different tactics, like online advertising, celebrity endorsements, you know, uh, uh, doing more in terms of sponsorships and things of that nature. So those are all tactics supporting the strategy. And that's something that you should be very clear on because sometimes companies get so uh, caught up in their strategies and the objectives that they interface and you're not clear on what you need to do. Budget. Um, again, uh, a lot of us have um, very, uh, a, a lot of excitement about doing all this, but it all comes down to budget budgeting your time and also the amount of money that you have to spend on this. And measurement is very important because after you've done all this in terms of public relations, putting together your news releases, maybe revitalizing your website, doing everything you have to do on LinkedIn, you have to take a step back and say, I've done all this and two months from now, where will I be? And then when the two months comes, find out what has it been in terms of return on your investment, in new business, in terms on building your business to the next level. So again, analysis. Okay, the 411 on news releases. And I'm gonna hand out this, uh, this is a great handout um, in terms of people who have never done a news release before. Um, this is from Duct Tape Marketing. Is anybody, fam is anyone familiar with Duct Tape Marketing? A great site. <laughs> And um, Duct Tape Marketing has a quick guide to organize your thoughts. You can go online. This is, um, a, I printed it off from the online publication. And you go to Duct Tape Marketing and it asks you certain questions about putting together a news release. And it's really amazing because after you put in all the information and organize your thoughts, you hit the last button and lo and behold, up pops a news release. So uh, you have to refine it just a little bit, but it, it's an excellent, excellent tool.
promotion. How is promotion a little bit different than public relations? Promotions and sponsorship, branding, um, it's affinity programs, you know, all those little key tag things we're all carrying around now, we're putting in our smartphones. It's testimonials, referrals, it's uh, putting together a plan for fre frequent buyers. Again, I can't impress upon you enough how important it is to have testimonials, do case studies, because this gives you the credibility and documents the fine work that you do. So that if you go into a meeting with a new client, you can show them these handouts, you can show them the work that you've done that has pictures of what you've done and also the testimonials of the customers that you worked for. And everybody likes the credibility and also the recommendations that come from that because people want to feel good about who they're working with if they've never worked with you before. Okay, different, um, some examples of promotions are the rebates, the coupons, the sweepstakes. Um, you can even uh, think about having a referral program with your customers right now, uh, logo items. How many of you have, um, for your crew, have shirts with your logo on them? Okay. Well, that's for those of you who don't. Something to think about even with your small business to have um, a pen with uh, your name on it to ha as a leave behind. Um, one other thing I, I was thinking about not too long ago when I, when I was looking for someone to do my deck and of course I went to the website and um, I did a Google search about people in my area who could re uh, surface the decks and then I was out on 271 and lo and behold as I was driving along I passed someone who had uh, one of those things on the outside of their truck, talking about deck services. Now, how many of you have some type of promotion on the outside of your car or your truck or whatever? Well, that's good advertising. And it was a magnet and mm -hmm. it came off. Oh, well, you need to fix that. Well, I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also like it too, if the, uh, and I don't know if it works for your, this area of construction, but I'm big on leave behinds. And you know, if there's something you can leave behind that stays permanently so that people remember you, that's a good thing. Because you don't know who's going to be walking into that person's office and they'll see your name and your brand, and it might, it might be someone who comes you know, as a guest and then it triggers something that they will, will want to work with you or look at your website. So getting the word out, getting your brand out as much as you can, that's the name of the game with public relations. Okay. Um, again, promotions opens doors to new uh, channels. And it's all about getting attention. Um, the nuts and bolts of the media roadmap. We've heard a lot about roadmaps uh, today so far. Uh, defining your goals and objecti objectives. Looking at your competition. You know, again, defining where you want to go, where you want to be with public relations, with your advertising, with your marketing. It's, it's developing a plan. A lot of my clients that I, I'll sit down with in our data dump sessions will say, I don't need a plan. It's all up here. Usually the CEOs say that to me. It's, it's all up here. You know, I don't need a plan. Well, if it's all up here, nobody else knows about it. And your whole crew, your whole team should know about it so that everybody's on the same roadmap and going in the same direction. So even if it's just a one-page plan that talks about your PR and how are you going to target with your news releases or where you want your business to go, you know, it's like the, the human mind is, is very, very unique in that if we write it down, it seems like we're more committed to it. So I would say develop your roadmap. Uh, the marketing budget. Again, this isn't in stone. It depends on your businesses. All your businesses are a little bit different. But again, a marketing budget has to be formally written. And usually the rule of thumb that uh, varies a little bit is 5% of revenues for the year. Again, you know, with all my clients, I usually sit down and say, what are, what are your objectives? What are your goals? What's your overhead? What do you want? What What's your bandwidth in terms of how much new business do you need to do uh, to get you where you want to go? How can you do it? How can you achieve it? And then we'll go work backwards to see what budget is needed to perform everything uh, that we need to get done. OK, in summary, again, what will your media roadmap be as it relates to advertising, as it relates to uh, public relations? And again, 
have it be flexible. Review it every quarter, every six months. It isn't something that's in stone. It's a living, breathing document that you need to be able to work with because things change all the time. Okay, I'm, um, I'm a big believer in if you can think about it, if you can dream about it, you can make it happen. The mind's a powerful thing. This was a long time ago, but it made a real influence on me. This is my late husband and my, my little girl, who is now 22 years old and graduating in June. But it was at a time we went whitewater rafting. And I'm kind of athletic, but not really. You know, my husband at the time said, oh, you're going to love whitewater rafting. And so we thought we'd go on this big thing where everybody rose together. Well, Renee was only eight years old, and she couldn't, we couldn't do that. So we had to go in duckies. So that's a one-person ducky. But when we started out, Renee and I were in a two-person two ducky. And I thought, well, this is good. I'll be with her. God watches over a mother and her child, so nothing's going to happen to me. Well, partway through the trip, about two hours into the trip, we were on this uh, whole excursion with about 15 other people that we didn't know. And it was a church group, and um, we were the only three that were not part of the church group. And so uh, Renee and I started falling far behind because we weren't coordinated enough to do the rowing, and the water was real. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't what you call you know, really exciting like what it is right here, so you really had to row. So partway through the thing, Olga, our tour guide, who looked like a female Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> said, you know, this is not going to work. You have to exchange duckies with your husband, because he was in a single ducky. Olga was from Germany, not doing too good a <laughs> rendition. But she says, you, you can't, you can't, we're slowing everybody down. So I thought, I said to Stephen, oh, I don't, I don't want to go in a ducky alone. You know, and he said, well, you're going to have to do this, because they're going to leave us behind. So we made the choice, and so, I went in the single ducky. Renee and Stephen went into the, uh, the two-person ducky. Everything was hunky-dory, but I kept falling more and more behind. You know, little Renee wasn't even helping me out then because I was alone. And so right before lunch, and I'm falling far behind, Olga gets on her mic uh, megaphone and says, Nancy, after lunch, you can come into the mother ducky, and you, then everything will be fine. And I say to myself, oh my gosh. I'm going to hear about this around the dining room table for the next 15 years that mom couldn't do this. So I started meditating and I said to myself, I'm going to be able to do this after lunch. I'm going to become like Power Woman. I'm going to go over the white water rafts, or white water waves, and I'm going to be able to do this. And that's the message that I have for you. Do your plan. See it in your head that you're going to do PR. You're going to do your differentiation. Have your elevator speech and you're going to be marvelous, and you can do it. If you believe in yourself, you can do it. Guess what happened? I, I did it. My arms felt like they were going to fall off. <laughs> but I went over this white, the, the, the waves got to be real exciting after lunch, let me tell you. And uh, Renee and Steven were far off into the distance, and all of a sudden the wave came up, and um, I made it through, and at the end, they had all the pictures out on the sides. Good marketing. They have all these pictures out because of the photographers are on the, uh, uh, the rocks. And uh, Stephen said to me, well, do you want any of these? I said, I don't care how much they cost. I want them all. <laughs> <laughs> so we bought three pictures. So take pictures of your crew, of your team, put it on your website, do the testimonials, do the PR, and you'll be marvelous, and you'll get more brand exposure and more business. I can guarantee it. Thank you very much. Thank you.